welcome all of you to this webinar, which is the seventh, staged by uh, the Research Project on Populism and Constitutional Democracy, which is funded by the Australian Research Council. They're all recorded and you can watch the others through our website, globalconpop.blog or on YouTube. And you'll be notified, those who've registered, when this one is edited and appears online. The particular focus of our project is on what we call anti-constitutional populism. That is, forms of populist regime that don't ignore constitutions and constitutionalism, but on the contrary, have serious, ambiguous, paradoxical, and in the view of many, hostile relationships with constitutional democracy. In fact, the three of us, Adam Wojciech, that's the guy, he's not there, but if you saw him, you'd see a beard, uh, but no hair. And then there's Wojciech, no beard, some hair, and me, uh, have just edited a book which comes out with Cambridge University Press uh, in February next year, and it's called Anti-Constitutional Populism. Many writers in the field, the mainstream, what our authors tonight would call the conventional view, would consider our title too wordy. Indeed, they'd think it tautologous because on their view, once a movement or regime is classified as populist, the rest follows. Populist regimes just are anti-constitutional. It's in their logic, their DNA, it drives their rhetoric, their policies, their programs. Conversely, such mainstream authors typically, so it's told, think that the notion of constitutional populism or populist constitutionalism is an oxymoron, contradiction in terms. The new book that we're discussing today, Power to the People, published by Oxford University Press, available uh, in hard copy for some time or some weeks, I think, and available on Kindle since Monday, is an engaging, winsomely written and powerful challenge to this allegedly mainstream understanding. Uh, if partisans of the former interpretation, that is the mainstream interpretation, who are exemplified among others by the next guest in our conversation, Jan Werner Müller from Princeton, who will, uh, we will be talking with in February, and by uh, Nadia Urbinati, who we talked to short time ago and discussed her book, Me the People. Those people are called by some historians lumpers. That is, there are a lot of facts, a lot of events, a lot of uh, variations, but they find some, see some unifying essence core. So everything that is populist has something in common with everything else, something deep in common with everything else. And in particular, in that view, it's anti-constitutional. Uh, Mark and Boyan are rather determinist splitters rather than lumpers. That is, they see a variety of populisms, and they believe that we need to respect that variety and not impose uh, an external unity on them of, a, of a, an allegedly pejorative sort. In a moment, we'll ask them why they think that and what their reasons are for dissenting from Main Street views. But first, let me introduce them. Mark Tushnet is the William Nelson Cromwell Emeritus Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. He's hugely, has been for some time, hugely prolific, influential, and wide-ranging constitutional and comparative lawyer. He joins us from New York, where it is at present 5 a.m. Uh, we salute you for that. Uh, Boyan Bukharic is Professor of Law at the University of Sheffield Law School. He's expert also in comparative and constitutional law, public law, EU law, many other things. He's also wide ranging, but he has a special uh, genetic connection with East Central Europe, having graduated initially from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, then gone on to do his master's and and doctorate in the United States, returned to Slovenia, first, I think, as a deputy minister at the Ministry of Interior of the Slovenian government between 2000 and 2004, and then for some years as professor of constitutional law at uh, the University 
of Ljubljana, and he has in recent years now relocated to uh, the United Kingdom. He is joining us at a more civilized hour, so I don't need to salute him. As usual, the panelists are Adam Czarnota, who is present at Białystok in Poland, Wojciech Sadurski, who is for the moment in Sydney, and I in Sydney. Wojciech is likely to have to leave in an hour uh, or thereabouts because he's covering a so-called hearing of a so-called case by the so-called Polish Constitutional Tribunal, which is likely to begin at that time. Uh, and if, if it does begin on time, he unfortunately will have to leave us before the Q&A starts. And however lively the discussion becomes when Wojciech leaves, it'll have to end in an hour and a half because Mark in turn had to train the case from New York to Boston. So we will chat for about, the five of us will chat for about an hour and, a, an hour, and then we will open to Q&A uh, for the rest of the time. If you want to ask a question, use the chat function, either to type your question or to write that you would like to speak. Carolyn, our project organizer and coordinator of all things technical in this uh, affair, will coordinate the questions. Uh, so let's get started. And perhaps I could ask Mark and Boyan, we start with the title, it's the, it's, that's where the book starts. The, and it's an arresting title. In fact, at one point, you might have been arrested for using it. Power to the people, constitutionalism in the age of populism. And since Mark and I are both of a vintage to remember when that phrase, power to the people, was coined and first used, uh, maybe I should ask you, Mark, what you intended to invoke and evoke with that head title, power to the people. Uh, sure, thank you. Um, well, as you noted, this is uh, a phrase that comes from the uh, movements of uh, uh, 1968, uh, and uh, I, we use it at least in part because those movements were uh, uh, characteristically on the left, whereas populism today is characteristically on the right, although not universally. Um, and uh, we chose the title to suggest that uh, unlike what you call the conventional wisdom, uh, two, two things. Um, first, that there was no um, uh, inherent uh, political valence to the idea of populism uh, uh, even today. That is sort of a footnote here is we don't discuss in the way that uh, some of the scholars in the field do the variants of populism that occurred in the United States in the 19th century and in, uh, in Russia in, in the 19th century. Our focus is entirely on contemporary populisms, um, which again, we think are, uh, are uh, politically varied, although on balance on, on the right. Um, and then the second point is actually in the subtitle, Constitutionalism in the Age of Populism. Uh, and that's consistent with the sort of implicit uh, thought in the title of your forthcoming uh, volume. That is there, is, there are kinds of populism that are at least not deeply inconsistent with constitutionalism as I would, we would put it properly understood or constitutionalism understood in a way that is uh, most useful for analytic purposes. There are of course forms of populism that are anti-constitutional, but again, we wanted to stress uh, and the third part of the book uh, talks about uh, the ways in which populism can be consistent with uh, what we describe as thin but uh, acceptably defined constitutionalism. Thank you. Boyan, can you take that on to sort of flesh out a little the kind of scaffolding of your argument? We have the conclusion that there are many sorts of populism. They're not all anti-constitutional. Uh, but you have, I mean, part of the richness and the texture of the book is the 
thought experiments you develop, the examples you look at, the way you try to think yourself into the heads of people, of leaders, who might have come to power in a hostile circumstance and have reasons other than anti-constitutionalist reasons to uh, do what they do. So could you, there, is a, there are certain characteristic moves, it seems to me, that you make, and I wonder if you could elaborate a little on them so that we don't just have the conclusion, we know the way you get there. Thank you, thank you, uh, Martin, for this great invitation and for this great question. Yeah, I would add another dimension or another point to Mark's two essential points, which is that we uh, try to move away from talking, dealing, examining populism as such, which is something that is usually being done in most of the, again, the, you know, the mainstream dominant uh, narrative. And we move to what we call social legal analysis. So that's why context matter for us. So we emphasize that point several times in the book. So we are quite reluctant to say anything, you know, general about populism as such because we don't believe that there is uh, anything like populism as such. So we make this move, and then we go into particular cases, examples, and examine their uh, ramifications in particular contexts. So only after that we argue we can make a sort of a final determination whether certain versions of populism end up on the more authoritarian spectrum or perhaps on non-authoritarian or maybe even more liberal spectrum, which is something that is not being discussed in the literature. But I would say that if you look at populism in that way, the examples are too diverse, too different, too different, too different, too rich, to be susceptible to this simplistic definition that populism entails certain things as such. So that's another move. And then the second one, I think also quite important, which is more developed in the last part of the book, uh, which talks about um, empowered democracy and uh, certain uh, implications of populism for other direct forms of democracy, is that um, sometimes populism is actually a needed corrective to anti-democratic tendencies in current uh, constitutional liberal politics. So we are arguing that sometimes the so-called uh, you know, veto points, the gates that prevent you know, the uh, you know, certain easy changes in constitutional politics needs to be changed, needs to be reformed, needs to be removed. That, that does not necessarily entail nothing authoritarian, nothing destructive of liberalism. And we also provide examples for that. So I think these two moves would be sort of also very important to add on the list of the first two that Mark mentioned earlier. Okay, you have, you start with a distinctive and strongly argued particular conception of constitutionalism that is the kind of benchmark against which all of these maneuvers and parties are going to be tested. And perhaps it would be useful to people who have not yet read the book to get a sense of what you have in mind at least for the purposes of this book, by constitutionalism. I leave it to you to decide, or both of you should chime in on this. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll uh, start, and uh, Boyan can uh, supplement what I have to say. So uh, we begin with uh, uh, the observation that um, analysis of constitutionalism depends on the idea uh, the, the things that you associate with constitutionalism, and that it is, it's of course easy to uh, define constitutionalism in a way that makes many forms of contemporary populism inconsistent with uh, constitutionalism. Uh, we prefer a, uh, as I referred to earlier, a thin definition of constitutionalism, um, which includes uh, um, I don't, reasonably free and fair elections um, and uh, um, um, some, uh, well, some, some degree of uh, open discussion. Uh, actually, the way I think of it, uh, mostly based on my uh, studies of Singapore, uh, is uh, uh, if people in the opposition don't wake up in the morning worried about whether they're going to be thrown in jail by the end of the day, 
uh, then we're in the domain of thin constitutionalism, uh, even if they're subject to certain kinds of um, restrictions or penalties for, uh, for, for their uh, uh, oppositional activities. And then finally, and I, I think for myself at least, uh, really crucial is to the idea of thin constitutionalism, constitutionalism is some degree of entrenchment of um, stable existing uh, modes of uh, decision making. Uh, not complete entrenchment. Nobody thinks constitutionalism requires complete entrenchment. We know that because there are always amendment rules, uh, but constitutionalism requires some degree of entrenchment. And, and just to elaborate on uh, the fourth point that Boyan added, um, on our definition of constitutionalism, it's not anti-constitutional as such in our terms to propose and adopt uh, some uh, reforms of the entrenched institutions where, as Boyan said, the populist leader movement uh, concludes that the entrenched institutions are obstructing their ability to enact the program that they were elected to uh, pursue. Uh, okay, so those are, uh, I, I may have missed some, but that's the core of our idea of constitutionalism. Boyan, do you have something to add on that? And then I'll ask something else. Yeah, just very briefly. So the, um, the, uh, the, the, the background uh, sort of motivation for introducing this idea is a very simple, which is, you know, to try to get, you know, as many people, you know, friends of democracy on the board to join us in this investigation, because with too thick definition of uh, Constitution, then we might initially lose too many people because you know, they vary. They're so different. So it's a bare bones definition. So what you know, what is the minimum that we all need to have in order to have this kind of, you know, quite proceduralist understanding of democracy? But it's nothing really. I mean, we, if you go back and look at Robert Dawes and some other authors, you'll see that it's being quite frequently used also in other works. Actually, if you look even at the Wojciech's account in his book on Poland, he also starts in the beginning with a quite similar definition. If you look at Tom Ginsburg, he also starts with similar. So I think what is important is the motivation to start with this definition. You, you, a part of the sort of characteristic strategy of the book, at least as it seemed to me, is that very often you take what have often been seen and described as assaults on constitutionalism, and you say, well, let's try to think of it from the point of view of the uh, alleged assaulter or the, the new leader. And you say, well, if you came in with a particular program, you might think differently about packing courts, about, um, about presidential time limits and so on. Could you flesh out that sort of argument? Because it, it underpins so much of the book that it would be good for uh, listeners to have some sense of that strategy and that argument. Um, sure. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I'll lay out what we call the political logics of some of these um, uh, um, uh, uh, efforts, sometimes successful, to alter existing institutions. Uh, I, I do want to note that we don't think that this is part of the general strategy of the argumentative strategy of the book. Uh, we don't think that these uh, this political logic always justifies what uh, populist leaders uh, have promoted, but uh, we do think there's a political logic that requires understanding, and that might sometimes lead to the conclusion that these uh, constitutional revisions are uh, are uh, not anti-constitutional. Um, so the basic uh, idea is that you have a movement uh, that is elected. Uh, that's an important characteristic of the modern forms that people are concerned about, that is elected, and it has what we call an ambitious reform agenda. 
Now it comes in with that agenda. It's promised the people that this is these are the programs it's going to pursue. And it faces a set of established uh, institutions, uh, entrenchments from the prior, the existing constitution. Um, now, the logic is that um, in some situations, if we are to do what we are elected to do, we are going to or already have faced obstruction from these uh, the, the people staffing the entrenched institutions. Uh, uh, now, sometimes we can uh, put up with that obstruction or figure out a way around it, uh, but sometimes uh, we have, um, uh, put it this way, uh, time limits on how, uh, um, how let, let me back up. Uh, sometimes we're the leader, the movement is concerned that enacting and implementing it as a program in a way that shows that the government is effective at doing what it promised to do, sometimes that takes time. Uh, and uh, if the obstruction uh, lasts too long, then the political base, again, that we were, uh, for which we were elected, will erode. So it, it, the logic is we have to get some stuff done quickly enough to show the people who supported us that we are effective at governing. Um, and that leads to, uh, can lead to uh, efforts to eliminate, again, what we call uh, uh, the veto gates, political scientists call the veto gates or the veto points, some veto points, the particular ones that are uh, obstructing our uh, program. Um, that's the basic political logic. So uh, with respect to presidential term limits, uh, if you come in with a program and you're faced with a constitution that says, uh, the president can serve only one term. Um, and you think that it's going to take more than four years, or even six years, depending on how long the term is, to get the program up and running, then you might want to say, well, we ought to give our president a chance by amending the Constitution to allow a second term. Uh, now, that logic you know, has its limits. And we suggest that uh, uh, the now sort of international norm of two terms of four to six years is probably the right thing to do. Uh, but some of the moves, again, to eliminate a one year, uh, a one term presidency aren't in our view, uh, inherently anti-constitutional. I know that Bojcik's been thinking about that issue. Is this a time that you would like to come in and ask about that? This is something which I thought about in the in a broader context of your approach to executive aggrandizement, uh, and also in the context of looking at the constitution as a uh, at looking at a constitutionalism as having nothing to do with restraining the power. But before I make this point, let me, because the point is somewhat critical, let me, uh, let me begin by saying that uh, this is a truly wonderful book, uh, that it is uh, formidable in the way it rejects, debunks various conventional wisdom that it's beautiful iconoclastic, and that compared to the conventional literature on populism, which is largely concerned with the narratives and rhetoric and the sort of language and the concepts that uh, populists use, you are taking very seriously, not just what populists say, but also what they do. 
And if I have an occasion later uh, in this part of our session, I would like to ask you to clarify what you really mean by populism. But going back to Martin's question, uh, there is a particular point which you are making, which sort of troubles me. And this is the point which is best encapsulated in your, um, in your sentence right at the beginning of chapter nine, uh, at page 178, when you say that whether assertions of executive power by populists are troubling depends primarily upon the merits of the populist program. In other words, you know, if the populists have a, this is my paraphrase now, perhaps uh, distorting, if the populists have a good program, we shouldn't wa uh, be worried about those various aspects of executive aggrandizement because they are on the right side. If they have a bad program, then obviously we should be worried about it, but not because uh, the executive consolidates its power, but because it's bad program. And the way you approach uh, presidential term limits, which for Europeans is a more or less exotic matter because there are not that many purely presidential systems other than Russia, uh, looking at, at, at sort of big countries, but obviously it's a very big issue in Latin America. Uh, then I was sort of surprised by a rather anodyne uh, approach to lifting term limits. So to be sure, and to be fair to you, at the end you say that probably you know, everything considered and all the usual caveats and provisos, uh, having some term limits is not a bad idea, but it is so qualified and so restrained that I really wondered whether you are not protesting too much in trying sort of to say, okay, sometimes it may be bad, sometimes it may be good. I think that we have now in sort of more or less certain empirical knowledge that this idea, which is now encapsulated by Marx saying, let's give the president a chance. More often than not, is just a propaganda of president, uh, that it is very much a self-serving type of ideology. Look, I mean, we have a good program. We are on the side of the people. We need not just four hours, but eight, 12, 16, etc. cetera. And, and we know from the empirical knowledge rather than general theory that more often than not, it is, uh, it is just a legitimation of despotism. And therefore that probably the best way of preventing it is to build these entrenched limits on, term, uh, uh, on terms. And even if there are some costs, because you will have this wonderful president who will be disabled from running more than two consecutive terms, the benefits in terms of making this very, very strict uh, obstacle on his or her way probably prevail. And I do not see much sort of, of this sort of nuanced approach to it in your, uh, in your discussion. And if I may just to, to finish what I'm saying, uh, I would connect it with something that you say right at the very beginning of your book in the chapter on constitutionalism, where you have a section or sub chapter uh, in which you say, oh, but by the way, thin constitutionalism, which by the way, I also endorse this idea, thin constitutionalism is not about restraining power because sometimes, because if the point is liberty, protection of liberty, then sometimes we need, we may maximize liberty, not just protect uh, uh, limiting power, but by enabling power. And I think that it actually goes a bit too far. I would agree that constitution is not only, and perhaps not, ex not primarily, although here I, 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 uh, I'm hesitant 
about limiting power. So I probably wouldn't go as far as you know our friend Andras Shayo, who basically says constitution is as about limiting the government, full stop. But on the other hand, I cannot conceive of constitutionalism, even the thinnest one, which among other things does not constrain power. And I think that this sort of term limits example is a nice illustration of this point. Thank you. Please. Um, Mario, do you wanna? No, go, go ahead, Mark. Okay, so, um, uh, that those are sort of very rich comments. Um, two, I think, prelim three preliminary uh, observations. Uh, the first is that um, as an empirical matter, and we talk about this a bit in the book, um, the COVID experience indicates that not all executives use emergencies as an opportunity to aggrandize power. Uh, so in uh, the United States and in Brazil uh, with populist or quasi-populist leaders, uh, the presidents refused uh, to do anything. Uh, and and you know, they, they didn't aggrandize their power. It would have been better if they had, uh, uh, if they or, people you know, better motivated were in power and uh, used, used uh, uh, expansive notions of executive authority to control uh, the spread of the pandemic. That's the first observation. The second observation is, actually it's tied to your notion, your, your observation about Europe. Um, I personally am struck by the fact that nobody seems to think it was a problem that Angela Merkel was prime minister for however long she was prime minister uh, or chancellor, whatever, her, her, not chancellor, whatever her position was. Uh, that is, uh, nobody thinks it's a problem in parliamentary systems that there's no stipulated time limit for a person to be uh, prime minister. Uh, and, and, you know, and there are problems with that. Angela Merkel was good. Benjamin Netanyahu turned out, you know, to have hung around too long. Um, uh, and, you know, so if there's a problem uh, about the length of tenure of leaders, um, it's not um, distinctive to presidential systems. And, and then the third observation, I do want to stress this, is uh, um, the uh, observation that uh, constitutions are bo both about uh, creating uh, and limiting power. Uh, and, and the question is always one of whether the Constitution, as designed or implemented, uh, creates or uh, establishes the right balance between empowerment and limits on power. And here, again, I want to stress the idea of the political logics what we what we talk about are situations in which um, the populist movement thinks that the current balance is given the nature of the problems they were elected to solve uh, askew uh, too much limitation not a mu not as mu not enough uh, uh, empowerment um, and, and they seek to rectify the balance without, and this is the argument we make in the last chapter, without saying we think that power in the government should always be uh, unlimited. Um, that's the position of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and that we think is anti-constitutional. But uh, we think that adjustments in the balance are not in themselves anti-constitutional. The question is what is being accomplished by altering the balance and what, I think Wojciech's right on this, what are the long-term implications of altering the balance now 
uh, with respect to what will happen after the people who have done the alteration have gone. Um, and here, this is a final empirical observation, uh, and it is about the term limits point. Um, the, Latin, the Latin American examples of populist leaders who tried to change the constitution so that they could stay around forever, um, are they're of mixed, um, um, it's a mixed picture. Uh, so in Venezuela, yes, in I, one of the Central American countries that we don't talk about in detail, I guess it's Nicaragua, yes, el uh, eliminating uh, uh, term limits has turned out to be a, a bad idea. In Bolivia and Ecuador, which are a couple of other examples, uh, there were efforts to, uh, uh, successful efforts to eliminate term limits. Uh, and the leaders who, uh, who proposed them uh, were deposed uh, in different ways, but they didn't, they didn't get the opportunity to take advantage of the um, extended terms that they fought for. Uh, so uh, again, we want to insist that the particulars matter and the context uh, matters. Um, I'll, I'll leave it. Come up in there because I, I am completely persuaded, and anyway, I think I believed that the context matters hugely, and we can't just have these kind of combinatory excesses. This looks a bit like that, looks a bit like that, and we know the essence of that. It seems to me that in the book you argue you have two forms of argument. One, which is you've just illustrated, is to show the number of a number of circumstances where people, leaders or movements who might be called populists don't do the things alleged of them. But then you admit, and you spend a good deal of time in the book showing that some authoritarian, authoritarian populists, as in Poland, Hungary, Turkey, Philippines, Brazil, India, India you're a bit more equivocal, are justly accused that that is, they are authoritarian populists, but then you have a kind of characteristic phrase which is repeated in one form or another very often, but if they are authoritarian populists, it's because of their authoritarianism, not their populism. And it seems to me this is a bit like the medieval legal strategy of confession and avoidance. Yeah, I did it, but uh, something else was going on. And why don't you countenance, maybe you do, but I don't find it in the book, the, the possibility that there are populist forms of authoritarianism, that these people don't choose to be populist just at random. But modern authoritarians, and I've listed some, choose populist rhetoric, populist ta tactics, parade a populist logic because it's useful to them. So maybe they're not true believers, maybe the populism is not the prime category, but it's a hugely distinctive and maybe significant, hugely significant, maybe distinctive category, which we could call populist authoritarian. Not everyone is like that, but that is different from other sorts of authoritarianism. It operates different ways. It does claim to represent the people as a whole, the real people, et cetera, et cetera. Can I just add to Martin that at least twice or maybe more, you are using a very significant uh, phrase, for example, about Viktor Orban, that he is, quote unquote, authoritarian parading as a populist or masquerading as populist, which sort of suggests that he's not a real populist. He's really authoritarian and his populism is just a, just a disguise. This, thank you. This is a great question. And uh, again, um, our sort of response is, you know, again, let's move to the context, let's look at the cases, don't talk about these issues, about, you know, some general phenomenon, populism as such, and uh, to, to the last point of Wojciech, um, they are populists to a certain extent, but they always, you know, the, the, another important part of their baggage is that also they are authoritarians, so it is very important not to, you know, fall victim to this idea, which is most clearly exemplified in the work of Jan Werner Müller, where he claims that populism as such brings all these bad things, that populism as such has a, you know, authoritarian connotation. That's something we try to show. 
simple as that. And uh, yes, uh, answering to, to Martin's question, many authoritarians mm -hmm. also dressed up as populist, use populist strategy, but then you have to look at the real action, the real results, and you see a little bit of populism here and there. For example, Polish populist, you know, promise, you know, huge, uh, mm -hmm. large social welfare interventions, 500 zloty plus and similar things, or Orban also promised a little bit of that, but that's not, you know, the most significant, the most important part of their program. So if you, uh, you know, read people working on Hungary, they will tell you that there is uh, actually very little about Orban making him a true populist. So Gabor Halmai would be the first one to protest against the use that Orban is a true populist. He has, of course, populist elements, who doesn't, right? Uh, I mean, you know, if you look at that way, you know, you have many centuries mainstream politicians who also have populist elements. So the matter is, you know, what prevails? And the key argument is that even though there might be some dosage of populism in their program, they are more or less, you know, authoritarian. There are authoritarian elements which make this populism dangerous. So in other words, we are trying to say that there is nothing endogenous in populism that makes it turn into authoritarianism, but rather exogenous. And in order to figure out what brings this dangerous element, we have to look at other factors. So that's a strong critique again of uh, Jan Werner Müller and Urbinati who made the opposite claim. They say it is something inherently within populism that turns this populist into authoritarian thinking. Mark, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, um, uh, I just want, want to note there's there's the flip side of this, uh, which is that um, the some of the things that are characterized as distinctively um, populist in rhetorical terms, the construction of us versus them being the primary one, uh, are actually quite common in politics uh, offered by uh, people who are not, uh, wouldn't conventionally be called populist. Uh, I like something that we pick up, um, I knew about it, but I just want to attribute this. There's a, a, a quite uh, interesting book about uh, Podemos and Bernie Sanders by um, a recent graduate, I, a PhD, I, I, just blocking on his name. But he features this statement by Franklin Roosevelt in the 19, I think it is 36 campaign, uh, which we quote as well, where uh, Roosevelt said, Roosevelt, okay, you know, upper class, whatever, the savior of capitalism, all that sort of stuff, says, um, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. Um, that's, a, that's, you know, political rhetoric that is effective under some circumstances and not effective under others. And you can expect all politicians to look for a kind of rhetoric that in the circumstances they face is likely to be effective. Now, sometimes, you know, Joe Biden uh, tried, succeeded with the no, we're all in this together rhetoric. Um, and so sometimes that's appropriate. Uh, or, or politicians will choose, you know, rhetoric. The fact that they're using an us versus them framing of the problem doesn't show that they are populists or that populism as such leads to uh, that framing. Okay, could we, the first two sections of the book deal with the present and the past, but really the present. In the third section, constitutionalism after populism, you venture some speculations, venture some possibilities of what a real constitutionalist populism might look like. And I think Adam is interested in that section of the book and perhaps, well, he's interested in every page, but among those pages, especially in that section, and Adam, if you would. Yes, thanks, Martin. Well, I I don't not I do not have too much to say. I could say that I like the book and agree with authors that it is impossible to build a general theory of populism. 
like Mark and, and Boyan, I also see the collective potential in populism. I also agree that approach to populism in power must be context sensitive and empirical. And I also like the style. It seems to me the style of the book is a sort of the nice manage, manage between the conversational style and presentational style. So it's a, I, what was interesting for me that that in the one point I find that authors disagree with each other and they explain why, what is the issue of disagreement. So that, <clears throat> however, what I could say, is, I should, should add also that I don't share with authors the assessment of, the, of Poland as an as a authoritarian type of populist, but I will leave aside. I don't want to discuss Poland at the moment. However, if I, I am to voice a criticism, I feel slightly unsatisfied by the book final section, Constitutionalist After Populist, what was mentioned by, by Marty. I still have no clear idea of what that might look like. Mark and Boyan developed two concepts which plays a crucial role, thin constitutionalist and thin concept of populism. And the book operates in the two layers, according to my reading, which is that <clears throat> it's possible to distinguish analytically these layers. That's constitutionalist as, let's say, theory, ideology slash ideology, and constitutionalist as practice, political type of practice. So <clears throat> what I would like to know from the authors is your opinion about the possibility of constitutional populism, not as a set of practices of populism in power, which is what the substance of the book analysis, but constitutional populism as a theoretical reflection upon those practices, a reflection of a kind different from the other types of constitutionalisms. What, what would, would a thin theory of constitutional populism involve and look like? According to my reading of, of your book, it seems to me that this concept of the thin constitutionalist and the thin populist is a good starting point. That's, that's all. Um, okay, let me uh, start and then uh, Boyan can uh, supplement. Um, uh, there are, uh, I think the distinction between the theory of constitutionalism and the practice of constitutionalism is uh, pervasive in our discussion. And the third part does say uh, that it's, uh, um, we say explicitly that populism in all of its forms is in some sense anti-institutional. That is, it is always willing to question the, um, the value of uh, entrenched institutions. Now, in practice, it doesn't challenge all of them all at once, all the time, but uh, it does in principle, populism is, we say in principle, committed to the proposition that um, it's always the, the value of entrenched institutions should always be open to question and the entrenched institutions should always be open to revision. Okay, so that's the first point. Um, the second is uh, we, we incline, I think me more than Boyan, to uh, regard uh, majoritarian decision making uh, as the core of, um, I would say, populism. I, I would say democracy, actually, empowered democracy uh, is uh, majoritarian decision making. Um, uh, uh, and uh, that means uh, a current majority, that is what the current majority wants, sort of presumptively should be what the current majority can get. Um, and that's also, um, I don't know, it's not anti-constitutional, but it's anti-entrenched institutions. Uh, and then finally, I guess I want to say, and this, I, I'm here, I'm influenced by this uh, really terrific article by, uh, I'm going to mangle his name, Ming Su Ko, uh, called Instantaneous Democracy, which I think uh, it resonates with Urbanati's work. Um, uh, I, I can imagine science fiction scenarios in which uh, 
all decisions on all matters would be made by a current majorities. Uh, and, and I confess, I'm not sure I think that would be a bad idea. Uh, uh, I think in practice, um, that process would be turn out to be um, no worse along dimensions of deliberation, for example, than many existing uh, democratic processes are. Uh, but I, I do want to stress that these are science fiction scenarios. Uh, Coe's article is called Instantaneous Democracy, and um, I think that's the title. Uh, and and no, no populist, uh, left or right wing, supports that the science fiction version of instantaneous democracy. Everybody's willing to say, yeah, we'll live with some entrenchments, uh, uh, which have some slowing down effects, but we're willing to you know, reconsider when the obstruction becomes uh, problematic. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, just very briefly about this last third part of the book. Um, uh, maybe I'll just uh, give one example, which I think really nicely shows and captures some of the things that uh, that Mark mentioned and also that uh, were sort of uh, part of the Adam's uh, uh, trouble or, 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 or questions in trying to understand what our key points are in this part of the book. Um, as a legal realist, we are of course quite averse and reluctant to provide any kind of you know big normative kind of you know theory that would guide then the reader at the end of the book how to move away from this and how to use populist constitutionalism as a tool for further democratization and so on. We just uh, provide again a couple of examples uh, with the uh, uh, fully explicating constitutional ramifications of them, and uh, and I'm. Let me give you one example. So, for example, Syriza in its in its uh, short stay in power, a little bit less than four years, you know, they you know wanted to remove one important veto gate, and that was fiscal fundamentalism as entrenched in the European constitutional law. And right after that, they were immediately attacked by all mainstream European media, everyone as a dangerous populist. Today. Everyone, even the European Commission agrees that, that fiscal rules are detrimental for, most, for European countries. And they're thinking about how to reform them, how to change them. It's a very difficult question. There are no easy answers. But the example shows is how dangerous is then you know, to think that anyone you know, who is approaching the constitutional entrenchment issues from different perspective can be simply diagnosed as a dangerous populist. So, and also shows that Sometimes it is desirable that populist constitutionalists remove certain veto points because you know they want to change something, and that would actually they didn't have a chance to do anything with Greece economy because they were prevented from Brussels. Brussels imposed a united front against Greece. They were defeated, and then the three years of staying in power were basically just you know uh, they had to implement the EU dictated program. I think it's, we've got to the end of the book, but not to the end of the discussion by any means. So let's move now to Q&A. There is a question in chat from Tinnus Rue, and I'll ask Carolyn if she could read it. She said, remembering to unmute, um, Tinnus was interested in the definition of constitutionalism rather than populism in this case. So he asks whether your definition of constitutionalism is descriptive or normative. He says if it is descriptive, then its thinness could be seen as largely semantic uh, as a move and, and it doesn't that does not do a lot of work in relation to the analysis of populism. If the definition is intended to be normative, then its thinness might make it less attractive to a wider range of people. Uh, and in Tunis's view, uh, we need a thicker normative account of constitutionalism to defend against its critics adequately. A uh, comment from Mark or Boyan on that. You're muted. Mark, you're muted. 
Uh, unmuted. Thank you. So I'll, I'll start, and again, uh, uh, Boyan can, uh, of course, come come in. Um, so as, as Boyan said earlier, uh, uh, there is a normative component to our definition, uh, it, because uh, we do want a sort of, I call it, least common denominator idea that uh, we think all, as Boyan put it, friends of democracy and constitutionalism could agree on. Um, uh, and, and the thicker the conception of, uh, the normative conception of constitutionalism you have, uh, the increasingly fewer people will uh, agree with it. Uh, just a, as a footnote here, uh, in something that actually comes into some of the discussions uh, of uh, various what they're called, what Europeans call memory laws. Um, I come from the United States, uh, where uh, memory laws and hate speech regulations would be regarded as obviously unconstitutional, or at least uh, almost subject to serious constitutional challenge. Everywhere else in the world, those are, um, in principle, perfectly compatible with constitutionalism. Now, it doesn't seem to me that it's uh, that that we want to end up with a definition of constitutionalism that is so thick that it excludes the United States on the ground that it doesn't prohibit uh, hate speech. Um, now, obviously, you know that's just a single example, but the the general point is uh, it is normative, uh, but uh, um, let me let me put it this way: um, if you want to criticize some aspect of some populist programs on the ground that they are anti-constitutional then spelling out the, the way in which the things are anti-constitutional is essential to be able to have a conversation about why they are or are not uh, uh, unconstitutional, uh, anti-constitutional. Um, and, and there, uh, I just wanna note, uh, we have a chapter uh, discussing um, uh, Kim Lane Shepley's idea of the Franken state, uh, where she thinks we're critical of her idea and her analysis. We, we think we're back basically agreeing with what she says, uh, where the point of the analysis is to say, okay, there are each of these things that are thought to be anti-constitutional. What's anti-constitutional about them? Uh, and some of them are inconsistent with constitutionalism. Others uh, aren't. Um, uh, okay, I'll, I'll stop with that. Well, well, now we, I think usually Shaban is is uh, off the floor. Oh, sorry. Tunis would like to um, make a comment in reply, so I'll just bring him in. Tunis, uh, when you appear on the screen, if you could please unmute so you can ask your question and turn on your video if you wouldn't mind. Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry, let me just try and get rid of that light that's shining there. Okay. So, look, I haven't got a fully formed view about this, and I should preface everything by saying I wasn't able to get a copy of your book on Kindle. Uh, when I searched for it this morning, the only book called Power to the People that I could find was a book that was promising to um, teach Americans rushing, Russian bodybuilding um, exercises uh, so they could empower themselves. Anyway, so, it's, so this might just be all in ignorance. But um, I, I always struggle. A lot of people make this, this move of offering this very thin definition of constitutionalism and then still calling it normative. 
And the difficulty I have with that is while everybody can agree, all right, that's a tolerable definition. No one, no one loves it really and embraces it. Um, and I think then actually the definition while purporting to be normative is actually descriptive in this way that you're saying this is at least a definition of constitutional, constitutionalism that doesn't exclude this range of important um, commentators. So it's, it's in, in that way, it's, it's, it's actually largely descriptive rather than, um, than normative. And then the rest of my, the rest of my point um, follows that, and, and I'll wait until I've read your book, but what worries me is that, you know, the, the thinner the definition of constitutionalism, um, then the easier it is to find various aspects of populism and all its variety compatible with constitutionalism. So that's the sense in which I'm saying it's a kind of a semantic move rather than a properly theoretical empirical move. And then the second point that I'm making is, is when it comes to the defense of constitutionalism, this rather thin um, definition is not helpful in the current age of global capitalism where a lot of people are now saying to survive, constitutions need to offer a rather thick understanding, for example, of how they're going to combat economic inequality. And if constitutions don't offer not just a thick understanding of that, but also the institutional mechanisms do something about that, uh, Ros Dixon has a paper on this in the University of Chicago Law Review, then they face the threat of popular disaffection and loss of legitimacy. Uh, and with that, the whole constitutionalist enterprise uh, falls short. So that's in a nutshell my concern. Thank you. Leanne, do you want to kick off in response? I would leave this one to Mark, actually. OK. Wow. Um, so uh, uh, I, what I, I, I do think, so a couple of points. Uh, uh, I think the more important one is the addressing uh, to this last point. Um, again, this may well come from uh, my perspective in the US. Uh, I, I, it doesn't seem to me that constitutionalizing the program of resisting global capitalism is necessary uh, for the program to be successful. Um, that is, uh, it seems to me it's a fine, I'd be behind it entirely, fine political program, any political party that promoted it would have my uh, support, not any, but you know, a, a good uh, party that promoted it would have my support. But I guess I don't see why uh, constitutionalizing it in any, I want to say strong sense, entrenched sense, uh, is, um, uh, is, is uh, necessary to gain support for the program. Um, I want to think more about, I, of course, there's some descriptive component to our uh, thin uh, constitutionalism. We do want to say, uh, well, here are a lot of places that look uh, constitutionalist, but they're quite different in many, along many dimensions. So what kind of definition will capture uh, as many of these places that we think are constitutionalist as possible? Um, and again, my, my hate speech example is designed to say, well, look, you don't want a definition that is going to say uh, definitionally the U.S. is uh, not a constitutionalist uh, country. I think you don't want that. Maybe you do. But in any event, that's the, 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 the point is to build on conventional um, uh, observations about what nations are constitutionalists and what aren't uh, uh, to generate from those observations 
uh, I think, normative notion of constitutionalism that we can then use for uh, uh, as the basis for um, talking about whether particular reform proposals are anti-constitutionalist or not. Thank you. Now, Yuzhik Shiban is, has the floor. Yuzhik is going to be our guest in the third of our next year's seminars after Jan van Miller in February, and Shayo in uh, April, and then uh, Yuzhik, I think, in June, July. Welcome. This is a full taste. Good morning from Britain and congratulations on your book, uh, Mark and Boyan. It's, uh, and the talk was great and uh, I enjoyed it and actually want to draw on something that Theonis mentioned about the semantic aspect. Because uh, I like uh, the provocation of the title. What is more populist than power to the people slogan? Yeah, nothing. <laughs> yeah, and it's uh, nothing can beat that slogan in terms of populist appeal, whether coming from the right, whether from the left. And uh, uh, my question is, isn't there um, an underlying problem with populism as a knowledge regime? Because every populist, calls for the common sense or some knowledge, uh, some the common view of the common people. And uh, it involves uh, a criticism of expertise, expert knowledge. And the problem of democracy is how to balance between the power of expert knowledge and the power of the common sense. And in that sense, law and constitutionalism is a problem and not a solution because uh, constitutionalism is the voice of legal expertise and populists actually always criticize legal formalism, legalism. So I was quite attracted by what you, Boyan, mentioned about legal realist approach, whether there is some epistemic or semantic bridge in your view. Second question, you mentioned uh, socio-legal approach, that you have a socio-legal perspective in your book. Um, isn't it interesting that populism rises when societies are deeply divided into those who feel disaffected, alienated, and those who feel fine, okay. So we deal with divided societies. And in that case, we would be always asking not whether power to the people, but power to the which people. And in that respect, Germany is a prime example of limitation of power of the people uh, through parliamentarianism and the whole post-war history is actually about how to limit the people which brought uh, Hitler to power and through plebiscites and through general election. This is just some provocative uh, uh, comment to throw at your power to the people. Thank you. Which of you would like to weigh in? Uh, Brian, why don't you start? Okay. okay. So uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Yerji, for, for, for uh, great uh, provocative questions. As to the first one, um, I do not necessarily agree. Again, you, you, to my, for my taste, you, know, you were too close to this sort of a general characterization of populism. You said populist usually say populists usually do you know, which populists you know, give me examples i can give you other populists which don't do that don't question that expertise bernie sanders is for me a quintessential you know good democratic populist and he has he says many things which are critical of the elites and so on but you know he's basically you know a, a fairly committed constitutional radical democrat so so i don't see you know any problem with that with questioning the the expertise so again it depends on each example of populism we're talking about and uh, after we you know decide that then uh, i would agree with you that we have uh, other examples of populism which presents the problem from the perspective that you described as to your second point uh, the socio the socio legal um, uh, 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 component of the book um we with 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 all that um, 
uh, uh, move to empiricism, to context, to details, is something that was largely missing in the accounts that we have uh, studied, read while working on the book, and that uh, providing more contextual analysis sort of uh, provides sort of a way out of this uh, sort of conundrum or, or, or a paradox, which, you know, basically creates the following problem. Jan Werner Miller's definition is, uh, you know, it's basically um, uh, correct from one perspective, but then also, you know, it, it leaves too many things out. I mean, if you think about his his definition only applied to, you know, cases like, you know, Eastern Europe and, and some other problematic countries, we don't have problem with that. I mean, the problem is that he leaves out, he explicitly says, you know, for many, you know, valid populists that they're not populist at all. So that's why we think the socio-legal account is helpful here. And that's it's why it helps you know, to further shed light on the character nature of populism. Mark, do you um, have any, do you have? Uh, yeah, yeah I, um, on the common sense uh, point, um, uh, which I think is a really important one. Uh, uh, in in the final chapter, we do talk about uh, common sense, um, and um, we draw on this is uh, the uh, philosopher named I'm blocking it for sure, Derek Darby, who uh, has a very nice piece about uh, the philosophy of W. E. B. Du Bois about what Du Bois calls wise souls. Ordinary people are wise souls. They have uh, common sense knowledge, uh, shop floor knowledge, various local knowledge that uh, can supplement uh, uh, and enhance uh, the value of, of what experts have to say. Um, and, and, and ordinary people uh, also understand that experts have something to say. Um, and so we think the, the um, the commitment among populists to the common sense of the common people, probably not, I mean, this is a democratic commitment. Um, probably, in uh, my view, not a, not a bad thing because ordinary people know that they know some stuff and they don't know other stuff. Uh, and, and that, I do want to say, uh, Experts who claim to know stuff sometimes are just, you know, completely wrong. I'm sort of working on a paper uh, about the COVID response in the United States. Uh, the working title is, quote, trust the science, end quote. And then the subtitle is the unfortunate uh, revival of the progressive case for uh, the administrative state, which is an expertise-based state. Um, the experts in the United States um, didn't do a very good job uh, in handling uh, COVID uh, and maybe uh, rebalancing common sense would have uh, been better. Maybe not, but uh, uh, we, uh, we, we do stress in the book um, the, the importance of uh, local knowledge as against um, detached expertise. Do you have any more on the chat, Carolyn? I don't. One let, me, let me just... I'm, I'm sorry, Rose Dixon has a question in chat. Oh, she, um, yes, just had to step away for a moment. It is not yet back. Well, let me quickly fill in... Uh, <laughs> One thing that also relates to, to Tinnis's question about thin constitutionalism, you explicitly disavow constitution, regarding constitutionalism as a regulative ideal, and you say rather you have to define it in terms of these specific elements. And I don't think see anything wrong with that, except that I think often in the book, you say, look, the question is, is the program a good one or a bad one if you thought at all in terms of constitutionalism as a regulative ideal what's it, what sort of regulative ideal is it it's adjectival rather than substantive so often i'm not, not trying to give a, a full account of it often what 
constitutionalism about is adjectives about power. Power should be moder moderated, should be tempered. This is what Montesquieu tells us nothing about what governments should do, but he does say they should be moderate, moderated, and he thinks of mechanisms for it, and some of them that we've mentioned. Similarly, the traditions of talking about tempering power, which doesn't mean necessarily, or doesn't at all mean emasculating, but it does mean constraining and channeling and moderating. If you think in those terms, I think a lot of the worries about some populists can't be satisfied purely with empirical inquiry, at least not in the short term, because you don't know after six years. But you do have Lord Atkin telling you power tends to corrupt or power corrupts absolutely. And these can be sources of concern that can be part of a lens of viewing what populists who don't have typically, or at least in the usual suspects, uh, commitment, either rhetorical or real, to moderating power. Excited. Um, okay, so, sorry. I'm actually at home and our cat is trying to interfere with the, uh, my, my Zoom conference. Um, uh, so I um, guess th this is the legacy of, for me, the legacy of uh, 1968, uh, which is that, I want to quote, uh, um, I, I won't get it right, but uh, Barry Goldwer, moderation in the pursuit of virtue is no uh, whatever virtue and extremism in the uh, attack on vice is no Fit, no fault. Uh, I my own my own view is that moderation is uh, sometimes maybe very often appropriate, uh, and sometimes things are really bad. Uh, and uh, um, I wouldn't take as a general principle that only moderate political programs, moderate. Uh, uh, a, a general principle of con that is constitutive constitutionalism that only moderation is appropriate. Um, uh, but that just doesn't seem to me right. Uh, Can I follow up on this one? Mm -hmm. yeah, yep. So. Uh, yeah, so so this is it's it's a response to Martin, but also there was other similar questions apropos this uh, um, uh, uh, moderating versus uh, enabling uh, aspect of constitutionalism. We have to understand that we are responding again to the sort of the I wouldn't call it necessarily mainstream, but it's a particular strand of thinking about constitution, which thinks, as you Martin correctly pointed out, the best example is, for example, Shire now that the only and exclusive purpose of constitutionalism is to, you know, you know, to temper, moderate the power. And we're basically saying that's not necessarily, that's not true. I mean, the, there are two aspects of constitutionalism. It's allowing power and, and, and also tempering the power. And then even within our thin definition of constitutionalism, there are so many elements which clearly show that we are concerned about moderating and tempering power. We are not, you know, <laughs> Uh, interested in giving, you know, majoritar majoritarian democracy, you know, full range. So, but, you know, having this discussion, which aspect is more important or which one is less does not mean that we are, you know, endorsing some, you know, uh, you know unlimited exercise of power. We are, we are trying to rebalance the, you know, the fixation of the current debate on the limitation of power. We, you know, and uh, um, I think we need a good, uh, this is a long conversation and, but, uh, that does not entail, does not logically entail that we don't worry about the abuse of power, not at all. I think we have time at least for one more, and is Rose back? She is not, but I have her question, which is, um, well, firstly, thanks for the great discussion. But the question is, does it matter how explicit the program is that a leader is expected to pursue or elected to pursue from the perspective of legitimate constitutional change to existing institutions and structures. For instance, 
If we think Trump was elected ostensibly to achieve certain economic objectives, but implicitly sent a message that he would pursue a program of violent resistance to identity-based change, is the latter still a legitimate basis for constitutional change? Uh, so let, let me take that up. There, there are, I think, two things going on here. One explicit, and then I want to supplement what, what Ross says. Uh, asks. Um, the first is, uh, if you have a leader with uh, uh, an explicit program and an implicit program. Now, uh, remember, the political logic that we talk about is you elected us to do something and here and and we need to modify some of the entrenched obstacles in order to, to do that. If the program is implicit, that is if people, if it's not part of your party platform, but if voters know that that's what you're going to do, uh, then they've sort of on balance said, or they said that, well, we like some of the stuff you wanna do, some of the stuff we don't like, some of the stuff you wanna do. We're gonna elect you and you'll figure out which stuff you wanna do. Uh, uh, and I think that's, our argument is, well, okay, if they do that, that's, they can pursue the implicit program. The second one is if there's, an, an explicit program and no implicit program. And this is, I don't know the details enough to be confident about this, but this is uh, Kim Lang Shepley's criticism of the uh, Hungarian, what is it, 2011 revisions. That is, uh, Fidesz ran on an explicit program and didn't say anything at all, she says, about constitutional revision. Uh, and then you can say, uh, um, and she's got a more recent paper saying, if you look at specifics, people don't endorse the things that were done. Um, I think that paper's a little, has some questions about it. But if the general form is, you elected us to do one thing, and now that we have power, we're doing something that you had no idea we were going to do. And so you couldn't have taken it into account. Taken it into account. Uh, then uh, uh, pursuing that other stuff is anti-constitutional. Well, last words? No, just uh, not directly uh, uh, following up on this particular, just a quick thing, which we didn't have time to discuss, but we often forget that, you know, there is a reason that we have these populist outbursts, you know, around the world. And uh, uh, and this is not really taken in explicitly in the book. So uh, apologies to Mark, this might be more something kind of my own thinking. I, although I think we agree a lot about it. Populism in many ways, you know, a response to, uh, politics of uh, no alternatives in the last two three decades, and uh, when we you know criticize populism, we have to take that very strongly into account. So, so when, so there's this line from Cas Mude where he says that uh, you know that uh, uh, populist you know illiberalism is a, in many ways a response to you know undemocratic liberalism of the two three the last three decades, and that's something that is not discussed at all, and that's why we have this problem if. Uh, in uh, sort of conceptualizing populism as exclusively uh, anti-democratic, uh, anti-constitutional phenomenon, which we simply try to show it's not. Sometimes it's just a you know, justifiable democratic response to the malaise of uh, you know democratic uh, or undemocratic liberalism, and that's a but that's another another uh, point for discussion for a large debate. Thank you. Well, thank you both, and thank everyone, and thank the audience. This I think is a very rich book and a provocative book and it was it provoked and uh, provoked discussion the discussion will be continued uh, in one way or another through next year in our successive uh, seminars and the next one will be with a target of much of the uh, of the spears and arrows of, of this book that is Jan van der Muller from Princeton and uh, not his book on populism but his new book which is called
democracy rules. So that is going to happen sometime late February, and you'll be informed about it. In the meantime, this discussion will be edited and uh, the recording put on line and everybody who's registered will hear about it. Thank you both again and thank everyone again. I enjoyed it immensely and I hope that enjoyment was shared. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.